Good afternoon, I'm Geraldine, if you don't know me, I'm a senior resident at Sing Health. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a speech today. Um, like, as uh, you all know, Noshin has already used it, uh, I'm going to talk about ECG. Is it really that simple, alright? Um, so, it may initially look like a mess of uh, incomprehensible squiggles on a piece of paper to most people. Uh, but I hope that after the talk today, uh, we'll reassure you that it's not that difficult to read the ECG, alright? And it's all about practice and pattern recognition, alright? Um, as one of my teachers used to say, uh, repetition is the key to retention. So that's what we'll do today. We'll repeat a lot of ECGs. And also feel free to ask any questions. All right? um, by all means, I'm not the ECG guru, uh, but I'll try my best to answer all your questions. Okay? So let's start. So just a brief outline of the talk today. Uh, firstly, I'll briefly illustrate the EMS system in Singapore for the benefit of our friends from overseas. Um, next, we'll go through some case scenarios, um, illustrating mainly STEMIs, FPTs, and non-bradycardias, things that you usually see on the ground. Okay? And we'll end with some take-home messages. Right? So this is uh, a very brief introduction to the pre-hospital EMS system in Singapore, just to put things in perspective from our friends from overseas. Okay? Um, the main focus of this talk is about recognizing malignant ECGs and not about this. Okay? So uh, we have uh, we run a single tier scoop and run system in Singapore, um, made up of mainly uh, intermediate level paramedics. Um, each um, each uh, team consists of a paramedic, a medic, as well as an ambulance driver. Um, we have a standby system in Singapore by which the EMS team uh, can actually radio activate the receiving hospital emergency department uh, to be on standby to receive a critical case uh, that requires immediate attention. All right? um, an example of a possible standby case is that of cardiac arrest. Yeah? Okay. So now that you have a general idea of our pre-hospital system, let's uh, go into case scenarios. So this is the first scenario. You have just started your ambulance shift at 8pm and there's a call for chest pain that just came in from the casino at MBS. So for people who don't know, MBS actually stands for Marina Bay Sands. It's the new integrated resort in Singapore that has a big casino over there, right? So arriving at the MBS casino, you see a middle-aged gentleman sitting on a chair next to the roulette table, clutching his left chest. He is in visible distress and is noted to be breathless as well as diaphoretic. You get your medic to take a first set of parameters and proceed to do a 12 lead ECG. Okay? So this is the 12 lead ECG that you see. Can I get a volunteer to tell me what do you see in the ECG? Myocardial infarction and it's also called a STEMI. Okay, so there are ST elevations as you can see here in V2 to V4, 
uh, and hyperacute T waves. Also, if you look closely, there's actually ST depressions in the inferior leaves, uh, 2, 3, A, B, F, and these are called uh, reciprocal changes. Okay? So, reciprocal changes in the context of a STEMI are, due to, are, are, are actually pointing to ST depressions demonstrated in the leaves imaging the areas anatomically opposite the areas of infarction. Okay? So, we see in the inferior leaves here for our anterior STEMI. Alright, does it sound confusing? It is. Okay, don't worry, we'll go through more ECGs later to illustrate this point, right? Okay, so um, according to the 2013 AHA guideline, the definition of the STEMI uh, uh, is listed as above. So first and foremost, the patient must have characteristic symptoms of a myocardial infarction, okay? Which are chest pain, diaphoresis, breathlessness. In addition, there's also a persistent ST elevation on this ECG, coupled with subsequent release of uh, biomarkers of myocardial uh, necrosis, which are measured as raised serum troponins. Okay? So, but in any case, if there's any doubt in the ECG, uh, as long as the characteristic symptoms of uh, chest pain, crushing chest pain, diaphoresis, and breathlessness are present, you can always treat as a MI first and stand by. So, now to the technicalities. How do we pick up STEMIs? Right? So first, before we go into that, we have to understand what is a J-point first. So the definition of a J-point. Yeah. The definition of a J-point is the point where the S wave returns to the baseline okay, to form the ST segment. If the J-point is elevated above the baseline, which is, it is in this case, you see the J-point is above the ST, uh, the uh, J-point is elevated above the baseline, uh, it shows a STEMI, a C elevation, right? So, the patient is considered to have a STEMI if its ECG shows new ST elevation at the A point in two or more contiguous leads uh, within, with the ST elevation more than or equal to 2 mm in band in V2 and V3 or with the ST elevation more than or equal to 1.5 mm in woman in V2 and V3. Also, if there are also new ST elevations at the J point of more than or equal to 1 mm in other contiguous leads. Right. There are also some special cases uh, which include the diagnosis of STEMI in a pace rhythm or in the presence of an LBDB and this um, institutes various criteria uh, that, has to be, that has been proposed but it's not within the scope of this lecture. Okay. So why is it important? Why are we all jumping on a patient when it's a STEMI? Is it just about good door to balloon timings? So, I'm sure most of you have heard here about the term time equals to muscle. All right. So the faster the reperfusion occurs, uh, faster uh, via PCI, the more viable myocytes are safe, and thus the better the outcome for the patient. Okay. So studies have shown that performance of pre-hospital ECGs uh, by trained personnel are associated with shorter reperfusion times and lower mortality rates for STEMIs. Uh, and also the use of pre-hospital ECGs and communication of this STEMI diagnosis to, uh, and transport to the PCI-capable hospital results in rapid reperfusion time and excellent clinical outcomes for the patient. All right? So it's not only about having good door to balloon times, it's about having good patient outcomes. So as promised, we shall go through some more uh, STEMI ECGs. Okay? So in this ECG, you can see there's ST elevation in V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. shows the anterior lateral STEMI. In this ECG, we can see ST elevations in V2, V3, and V4, showing an anterior STEMI. Okay. And in this ECG, you can see ST elevations in V2, 3, and AVF, all right, and also in V5 and V6, which shows an uh, inferior lateral STEMI. And also note that there are ST depressions that you can see with shown by the arrows, and these are reciprocal changes, all right? Okay. So this is another ECG of the STEMI. ST elevation in 2, 3, ABF, as we've seen just now, as well as the lateral leads, V5. Um, there's also ST uh, depressions, the reciprocal changes that we talked about just now, okay? But for this ECG, I want you to look at the P waves, the rhythm strip. Okay, so do you see this, the blue arrow? There's no P wave before the QRS. So this is a junctional rhythm. Right? And then later you see, hey, there's P wave coming up again. Okay, so this 
This shows a junctional rhythm that went into a sinus rhythm. So this demonstrates the point that inferior stamines, in inferior stamines, we have to look out for rhythm disturbances as the AD node is often supplied by the right coronary artery, which is also the same artery that surprised the inferior part of the heart. Okay? So now for the more unusual cases and other interesting STEMI ECGs. So this is a 76-year-old Chinese female who presented with chest pain and diaphoresis. Okay? Um, I'll just go through the ECG with you. You can see there's tall R waves present in V1, V2, V3 with deep ST depressions and T inversions. Okay? And this actually illustrates a posterior STEMI. Okay. So I'll just flip over the pictures to show you. So actually the, the leads in V2 and V3 are looking anteriorly at the heart. Okay? So if you want to look at the posterior part of the heart, you actually have to imagine it like a mirror image. You have to flip the ECG over. And when you do that, actually, when I show you here, you actually see a STEMI, which is an ST elevation. Right? This is really quite rare. Like it's not usual that only have an isolated posterior study. Right? So this is another case. It's a 60-year-old Indian male who presented with chest discomfort, diaphoresis, and breathlessness. Okay? As you can see in this ECG, there is widespread ST depressions. So ST depressions in all other leads as well as an ST elevation in AVR. Okay? So this actually, um, this actually, actually, this ECG actually is indicative of a left main disease or proximal LAD disease, okay? and the patient requires PCI as well. Okay, so I think we have enough of STEMIs already. Let's move on to scenario two. Okay, so you have been called to respond to a 995 call for chest discomfort at one of the university campus. As you arrive at the offices, you meet a young 21-year-old girl looking very anxious. Okay? Her lecturer tells you that she was having an exam when she felt very unwell. She described it as her heart was pounding and that she felt chest discomfort and breathlessness and she never had this experience before. Okay? Your trusty medic has taken the vitals and it's shown here. The BP is 140 over 89, heart rate is 168, SpO2 is 98 percent of room air and you proceed. Because of the tachycardia and the symptoms, you proceed to do a 12 ECG for the patient. Okay. So this is the 12 ECG for the patient. Maybe I give you some time to have a look. Then we'll get someone to tell us what the ECG shows. Okay. Okay. So what do you all see in the ECG? Any volunteers? Describe the ECG first. Uh, it's a regular four Great. column left right column. Very good. Fantastic. And, uh, okay. No, no obvious, uh, yes, great. And so it's uh, SVT, uh, supraventricular tachycardia. Okay, very good. Yeah, everyone <laughs> seems to know the answers already. <laughs> okay, so, like, uh, okay, so the ECG has already been described. Would you stand by the patient? Yes? Okay. Um, next, for pre-hospital treatment, will you give supplemental oxygen? Yes. Vagal maneuvers, like the balsava maneuvers? Yes. Great. Okay. So, like we rightly pointed out, this patient has SVT, a supraventricular tachycardia, right? So, and this uh, SVT is actually defined as a rapid heart rate of more than 100 beats per minute, it, and it originates... Um, at or above the sinoatrial node. Okay. So the, this is a basic classification table for happy or um, It is not a comprehensive list, but includes most of the important things that you need to know. Okay. So as you can see, SVTs fall under narrow complex. Oh, sorry. Tachyarrhythmias with regular complexes, yeah. and uh, we'll not discuss the rest of uh, the tachyarrhythmias. Okay. So now to the crux of the question, how do you pick up SVTs, right? Um, there are three main features of SVTs. They are regular in that all the RR intervals are constant, okay? And they have narrow complexes in that the QRS complex is, uh, the duration is less than 120 milliseconds, okay? And there's tachycardia and the heart rate is more than 100, all right? So to diagnose SVT, they have to have these three criteria like rightly pointed out by a member of our audience. 
it must be regular, narrow complex, and it must be tachycardia. Okay? So let's move on to see some examples. So is this a SVT? No? See before checking that. Okay. So it is regular, there's tachycardia, but there's not there's no narrow complexes. The complexes are all broad, right? Okay. So is this a SVT? No? There is narrow complexes, there is tachycardia, but it is not regular. You can see here, it's not regular. In fact, if you look at the rhythm strip, you can see very nice flutter waves. This is actually atrial flutter. Right? So is this ECG showing SVT? Yes. Okay, it is regular. There are narrow complexes. Okay, and it is tachycardic. So yes, this is a SVT. Alright? Okay, one more. So this ECG, there is, it is regular, there are narrow complexes, and it is tachycardic. So this is also a SVT. Alright? Okay. So now that we are comfortable with identifying SVTs, um, how do we treat them? Okay. So first we have to determine if the patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable. We are looking out for signs and symptoms of decreased consciousness or shock. If they are present, then the patient is unstable. Okay. So in our pre-hospital setting for unstable patients, our main objective is to expedite transfer to the emergency department. All right and uh, institute supportive measures on route. Thus, we need to stand by the receiving hospital, give high flow oxygen, and start IV drip for the patient, right? On the other hand, if the, for hemodynamically stable patients, vagal maneuvers like the Valsava maneuver can be attempted in the pre-hospital setting on route to the ED. Okay? So what do we actually do in the ED with such patients? So for patients that are hemodynamically unstable, we sedate them, give them synchronized cardioversion, starting at 50 joules and increasing energy level if unsuccessful. For hemodynamically stable patients, we give them AV nodal blocking agents like adenosine and calcium channel blockers like Veracamil or Zutazen to avoid the rhythm. Okay, so that's enough for SVTs. Now for scenario three. Sorry, I'm rushing a bit because I only have five minutes left. <laughs> so you have reached the home of an 80 year old Chinese gentleman who have called the 995 hotline for syncope. And he's been having worsening giddiness over the last few days and was about to have lunch when he suddenly fainted at the table. Okay? So when uh, you reach him, he has already woken up and he's now awake and alert. Uh, don't lethargic. Your medic has taken the vitals and the vitals are as shown. BP 120, uh, 102 over 58, 144, SPO 97 on room air. And in view of the presenting symptoms and bradycardia, we decide to do a 12 lead ECG for him. Okay, so this is the ECG, the 12 lead ECG for the last case. And what do you see in the ECG? Can you see? Volunteers who would like to describe the, this ECG? I can't hear you. Complete heart block. What do you say is a complete heart block? Because the T and the T is independent, it's regular, while the QRN is regular. Very good. I think our audience is very good. Yeah. Our nurse. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, that. Okay, so let's get on it. Okay, so it's a complete heart block. Okay, so will you stand by the patient? Yes? Yeah. Okay. And next for the pre hospital treatment, we'll give 100% non mask. Yes? Okay, would you give IV a choking? Yes? No? No? Okay, so while you think about that, let's get down to what a complete heart block is. Okay? So the complete heart block is also called the third degree heart block. It describes the rhythm where the atrial contraction is normal, but there are no beats that are conducted to the ventricle. Okay? The ventricle are then uh, excited by a slow escape rhythm from a depolarizing foci within the ventricle. Okay. So, how do we pick up um, complete heart blocks? The EC ECG features are as listed. There's presence of both P waves and QRS complexes. Only that, there is no relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes. That is to say, there's no QRS complex following a P wave and thus the P waves are not conducted, okay? So, um, sometimes you might be able to see abnormal or broad QRS complexes, but this may be due to abnormal spread of the depolarization from the ventricular fo focus, okay? So, uh, looking at, at the ECG from scenario 3, you can see that 
the presence of both P and QRS waves. Okay, so the P waves are shown by the small red arrows here. Okay, and you can see the QRS shown by the blue arrows over here. Okay, and you can see that there's no relationship at all between the P waves and the QRS uh, waves. The P waves are conducting at their own regular rate, marching along like that, and the QRS are conducting at their own rate, marching along like that. So now that we have diagnosed complete heart block, uh, what should you do in the pre-hospital setting? Okay. So the same, same as for SPT, we have to check if the patient is hemodynamically stable. If uh, we check for signs and symptoms of shock, uh, altered mental status, hypotension, diaphoresis, chest pain, breathlessness, penis or syncope. So if any of these are present, the patient is not stable, and you'll have to stand by the receiving hospital, give high flow oxygen, um, start the IV drip. If the BP is low, you can give IV atropine as a uh, protocol. Okay? Um, if, on the other hand, if the patient is stable, just transfer to ED as soon as possible for further management and continue monitoring on the way for signs and symptoms of shock. Okay? Okay, so this is another example of a complete heart block. You can see the red arrows pointing to the P waves, marching along regularly, like that. And the blue arrows pointing to the QRS, Okay, and there's no relationship between the P waves and the QRS waves. So this is a complete heart block. Alright? Okay, sorry for the rush, but my time is up. My time is up. So um, we come to the end of the lecture. Uh, just some take-home points before I end. Firstly, do not fear the ECG. It's all about pattern recognition. And remember, practice makes perfect. Okay? Um, always treat the patient and not the ECG. And you can always stand by if there's high clinical suspicion. And just to round it all, yes, ECGs are really just that simple, okay? So I'd like to thank you all for listening to my talk, and special thanks to Prof Rahu, without which this would not have been possible. Thank you.